are probably a lot of brake experts among you men today, and maybe some who are not quite so expert. Today's session should be valuable to expert and amateur alike. The subject is the disc braking systems offered on some of the 66 models. And I can't think of anyone better qualified to talk about them than Sam Douglas. Hi, Sam. Hi, Tech. Thanks for the compliment. As a matter of fact, I was just starting to explain some of the fine points of disc brakes to my young friend Hank. Why don't we make it a team operation? Okay, partner. Start it off. Now, before anyone gets the wrong idea, I want to emphasize that the introduction of disc brakes doesn't mean that drum-type brakes are obsolete, not by a long shot. As you know, Chrysler Corporation has a long history of producing the most efficient, most dependable drum-type brakes in the automobile industry. I think the most important advantage our brakes provide is straight-line stopping, which simply means that after a quick stop, your car is still pointed straight ahead and in your own traffic lane instead of being crossways. With disc brakes, directional stability is exceptional, even during high-speed stops. In addition, disc brakes have high resistance to fade, are smooth operating, and there's no brake pull, even in a panic stop. I'm convinced that disc brakes are great, but why do we use them only on the front wheels? Why not all the way around? <laughs> I thought you'd never ask, Hank. One good reason, Hank, is that most of the braking torque is absorbed at the front wheels. Any additional braking power at the rear wheels just wouldn't be worth the extra cost. Here's another reason. The drum-type rear brakes provide an excellent parking brake. It'd be very difficult to get the same results from disc brakes through mechanical linkage. There are two different disc brake systems available on the 66 models. Although the basic operation of the two systems is very similar, there is no parts interchangeability between systems. The disc assemblies used on Valiant, Dart, and Barracuda require 14-inch wheels. The rear wheels take 10-inch drum-type brakes with one and three-quarter inch wide linings. The other system, available on Fury, Polara, Monaco, and Chrysler, requires 15-inch wheels and has 11-inch by two and a half inch rear brakes. The rear linings are heavy-duty police type. Hydraulic modifications include a master cylinder with a one and one-eighth inch bore and a seven-eighths inch rear wheel cylinder. Both systems have a larger master cylinder reservoir to supply the extra fluid requirements. How about disc brake operation, Sam? Okay, Tech. Both systems are fixed caliper types. That is, the braking torque is absorbed through the caliper or piston housing, which is bolted to the steering knuckle and steering knuckle arm. Inside each caliper assembly, four pistons provide the apply force for the brake shoes, which contact both sides of the disc. The disc is cast with ventilating louvers between the two contact surfaces. The louvers dissipate heat rapidly, which is an important factor of the anti-fade characteristic of disc brakes. Two brake shoes, one on either side of the disc, provide the fixed friction surfaces. When the brakes are applied, the shoes are forced against the disc, gripping it like a clamp. It looks like the disc is pretty much exposed to dirt and water. Doesn't that affect the braking efficiency and lining life? It would, Hank, except that the brakes are self-cleaning. Right, Sam? Right, Tech. For one thing, centrifugal force throws most of the water and mud off the disc, and the high application force quickly wipes any remaining moisture from the disc. Also, the shoes clean the disc, even when the brakes are not applied. On the compact cars, there's a clearance of only about five thousandths of an inch between the disc and the unapplied shoes. On the larger cars, the shoes actually ride lightly against the disc. A spring behind each piston applies just enough force to keep the shoes in light contact without causing any appreciable drag or lining wear. The small clearance in the compact car system is provided by the square piston seal rings. When the brakes are applied, the seals roll slightly with the movement of the pistons. Then when the brakes are released, the elasticity of the seals pulls the pistons back slightly from the shoes. Then, any small amount of runout in the disc taps the shoes away to establish the clearance. There's also an inner dust shield to help keep the disc and shoes clean. The wheel serves as an outer shield. How about the hydraulic system, Sam? Coming right up, Tech. There are some differences between the two systems. First, and probably most important, 
you won't find a residual check valve in the master cylinder on these disc brake jobs. You'll recall that on drum type brakes you always have 12 to 18 psi residual pressure in the lines even when the brakes are not applied. The residual valve makes it possible to pump up pressure in the brake system. In addition, residual pressure forces the wheel cylinder cups against the cylinder walls to seal the hydraulic system against dirt and air. The shoe return springs overcome the residual pressure to keep the shoes from riding on the drum. Otherwise, there would be a heavy drag. There are no return springs on the disc brake shoes. And there are two large pistons for each shoe. Any residual pressure on the disc brake pistons would cause a very heavy brake drag. In fact, in the system used on our larger cars, a residual pressure of 18 PSI would cause 320 pounds of application force on each of the discs. So, if you have a complaint of front brake drag on a disc brake car, always check the master cylinder to see if it has a residual valve. If it does, simply take the valve out. There's still a residual check valve in the system, Hank, but it's been moved from the master cylinder to the rear brake line. We still need the residual pressure in the rear brakes. What's that other valve? It looks like it only affects the rear brakes, too. You're right, Hank. It's called a proportioning valve, simply because it allows only the correct proportion of pressure to be applied to the rear brake pistons. Now, here's why that's important. During a severe braking application, most of the car weight is thrown onto the front wheels. So it just makes sense to do most of the braking at the front wheels, where the weight is. If the same amount of braking force were applied to the rear wheels, with less weight on them, the wheels would skid, and the car would probably slew around sideways. This is one thing we want to avoid. So, the proportioning valve limits the amount of pressure available to the rear brake cylinders so they won't skid. And we get the famous Chrysler straight line stop. I noticed that the proportioning valve is used only on the compacts. What about the bigger cars? We don't need the valve on the bigger cars, Hank. In that system, the piston area in the rear wheels is much smaller than in the front wheels. The area proportion is such that we can use the same pressure all the way around. Before we get away from talking about proportioning, here's something you ought to know about. If a Valiant, Dart, or Barracuda has a tendency to slide the rear wheels during a brake application, check the proportioning valve. The test procedure is covered in the reference book for this session and in your service manuals. Be sure you use the special gauges with the high pressure hoses. The disc brake pads don't look very big to me. How about lining life on these disc brakes? It seems like they'll wear out a lot faster than drum type brakes. Not so, Hank. Our tests at the proving grounds have shown that disc brakes last at least as long and sometimes twice as long as the drum type linings. Just like any other braking system, it depends on how you use them. I couldn't have said it better myself, Tech. Now, maybe I'd better get into some of the differences between the two systems and some of the service techniques that are a little bit different than drum brake service. I'd say that's a good idea, Sam. But only after someone flips that disc that's on the record player. After all, we don't want the disc to break the needle now, do we? The basic construction and operation of the two disc brake systems are very similar. There are, however, some differences that will affect servicing of the units. You'll notice that only one fluid line feeds the whole caliper assembly, even though there are two large pistons in each half of the caliper. To supply fluid to the two pistons in the outer caliper section, Valiant, Dart, and Barracuda installations have an external transfer tube between the inner and outer caliper halves. It's located on the top of the assembly to avoid damage from stones. The bleeder valve on these units is at the top of the outer caliper half near the transfer tube, so you have to pull the wheel to get to it. Otherwise, the bleeding operation on both units is no different than on drum-type brakes. There is one difference, Sam. You're gonna have to add more fluid in the master cylinder when you're bleeding discs than on drum-type brakes. It takes quite a bit more fluid to fill all those cylinders. Thanks, Tech. That's a good tip to remember. The bleeder valve on Fury, Polara, Monaco, and Chrysler is located at the top of the inside half of the caliper. The fluid transfer from the inner half to the outer half of the caliper on these models is through internal crossover passages in each end of the caliper halves. 
two O-ring type seals between the caliper halves prevent leakage at the crossover passages. How about lining replacement? It looks like a pretty easy job. It sure is, Hank. And they're mighty easy to inspect, too. Right, Sam? They sure are, Tech. On the Valiant, Dart, and Barracuda, the shoe and lining assemblies are retained by a combination splash shield and anti-rattle device. To inspect the shoes, remove the wheel and tire assembly and the splash shield. If the lining is worn to the extent that the shoe and lining is 3 16 of an inch or less, replace both shoes. I noticed that the outer side of the shoe has two tabs. Do they have a purpose or are they just used in manufacturing? Those tabs are signals, Hank. When the linings wear down to an unsafe thickness, the tabs rub on the outer edge of the disc face every time the brakes are applied. The scraping noise tells the driver he needs new linings. The tabs won't harm the disc if the linings are replaced within a reasonable length of time. Shoe replacement on this assembly is real easy. Just pull the two shoes out through the dust shield opening and put two new shoes in. You'll have to force the pistons back in their bores to get enough room for the new shoes. Here's a tip to remember when you're replacing shoes. Before you try to force the pistons back in their bores, drain some of the fluid from the master cylinder reservoir to make room for the fluid in the caliper cylinders. Here's why. As the brake linings wear down, the fluid level drops. More fluid has to be added to maintain the correct level. When new linings are installed, there isn't room in the system for this added fluid. But be mighty careful when you're draining the reservoir. You don't want to get any dirt in the system. I have a caution note here, Tech. When you're loosening the reservoir cover nut, be sure to hold the bolt to keep it from turning. Otherwise, the top half of the reservoir will be loosened. To inspect for lining wear on Furies, Polaras, Monaco's, and Chrysler's, remove the wheel and tire assembly. If there's less than a 32nd of an inch of lining, replace them. There's a little bit more involved in replacing shoes on the bigger cars. You have to lift the caliper from the disc to remove and install shoes. You can remove the caliper without breaking into the hydraulic line. Just be careful not to kink or twist the flex line. There's a special tool that we use for replacing shoe and lining assemblies on this unit. It's a piston compressor, used to force the pistons back in their bores to give us working room. Here's how it works. First, remove the shoe anti-rattle spring and the caliper attaching bolts. The upper attaching bolt also holds the fluid line bracket. Lift the caliper assembly off the disc carefully so you don't put a lot of strain on the fluid line. Then, remove the shoes. The shoes will be loose in the caliper when it's lifted off the disc. And don't worry about the pistons coming out of the bore. They can't get past the dust boot retaining ring. Right, Tech. Anytime you pull the caliper from the disc, it's a good idea to inspect the assemblies for signs of fluid leakage. You may have to replace the seals. Why the extra biscuit on the end of the piston? I didn't see it on the other unit. That's a heat insulator, Hank. And you're right. They're not on the compact units. If there were no insulation between the piston and the shoe, the extreme heat generated by the lining and the disc would be conducted through the piston and into the fluid the fluid would boil and we'd lose hydraulic pressure. Because the piston is cup-shaped on the other unit and the open end is against the shoe, no insulator is required. The small piston area that contacts the shoe doesn't pick up much of the heat. When you're ready to install new shoe and lining assemblies in the Fury, Polara, Monaco and Chrysler unit, place the new shoes in position in the caliper. Then, Install the compression tool with the legs of the tool between the linings. Turn the knob of the tool to separate the linings just far enough so they'll fit over the disc. With the compression tool in position, lower the caliper assembly down over the disc. As the caliper is lowered into position, the disc will force the tool out from between the linings. Install the caliper attaching bolts and tighten them at 70 to 80 foot-pounds. Install the anti-rattle spring and make sure it has enough tension to grip the caliper firmly. Because of slight variations, new disc brake linings may have a tendency to pull to one side or the other the first few times they're applied. The customer won't expect this, so it's better for us technicians to drive the pulling tendency out of them. Right, Tech. 
It only takes a few hard stops from about 40 miles an hour to remove any irregularities from the linings and seat them in properly. But be sure to refill the master cylinder before you start out. And be sure to use only Chrysler-approved brake fluid. Are there any other special tools required to service the disc brakes? There are two tools in addition to the pressure gauge and the piston compression tool, Hank. A piston remover and a cylinder hone. The piston remover is used on Valiant, Dart, and Barracuda. It's almost impossible to get the pistons out of the calipers without the tool. Remember, the square seal in the cylinder grips the piston as it moves in the bore. The cylinder hone is used on both disc brake units. But don't hone more than two thousandths of an inch out of the bores. If you have to take out more than that, replace the caliper. When you're honing cylinders, don't forget to put the hone baffle in the bore. If it's not in there, the stones will probably break when they hit the bottom of the bore. Thanks, Tech. And here's another don't. Don't ever try to reface a brake disc to true it up. If there's more than five thousandths of an inch lateral runout, the hub and disc assembly should be replaced. And don't forget to read the reference book for this session. You'll find some valuable service tips and more complete explanations than we can present in a film. Also, get well acquainted with the brake section of your service manual. It'll keep you out of trouble if you have to overhaul the calipers. See you next month. Thank <laughs> you.